Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we've got a real treat. Mark Firth is in the house. Mark is the founder of B2B Growth Team. He spent a large portion of his life working a corporate job in London. He worked for companies like IBM, Siemens, but he left feeling unfulfilled. He was in search of answers and an 11-year journey from the UK to Colombia for a decade fell in love and started a family and then a business. He finally made it to Florida on an investment visa supported by his business. He runs B2B Growth Team, which has helped hundreds of B2B consultants to land clients through a mix of organic and paid business strategies. If you don't know Mark, he is all over Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, similar platforms where he teaches his followers how to scale their consulting businesses escape cold messaging, and build B2B virtual event funnels so they can reach more prospects. You can find him at markfirthonline.com. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you rather than than the other way around. I'm really excited to be here and I've just learned all about the definition of hustle, which I think we'll be covering today, right? Sure. Well, we're going to talk more about you than we talk about us, but uh, I'm excited. I've, I've been following you now on LinkedIn for... Yep. Probably a good nine months, and kind of your process inspired me a bit. Yep. And I've kind of always had you bookmarked as someone who'd be really interesting to have on the show okay. because there are so many consultants and entrepreneurs out there listening to the show, and a lot of what you promise and talk about on your website, and a lot of the awesome content you're promoting mm-hmm. every day on LinkedIn, I think is a lot of the answers that our listeners are looking yep. for. So before we jump into some of the tactical stuff, Mark, tell us a little bit more about your journey and how you got to where you are now. I think it's a really interesting question. I'll try and give you the highlights, but I think like a lot of people that that maybe are watching this, they might be at some stage of this the, 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 this journey. I spent my 20s deep down knowing that corporate wasn't right for me. And I think I always, or I think I always knew that I was destined to start a business, but kind of got slapped down by my brain every time I dared to bring it into my consciousness, fear, lack of knowledge, whatever you want to call it. But I never did it. And I ended up leaving corporate because I great people, just not my people. Okay. Work, not my work. I didn't want to be there. Right. And and I still wasn't brave enough to start a business, so I ran away. And I ended up in Colombia, going to Colombia for three months. Ended up staying almost 11 years, left with kids and a family, and, and made it into the States. And the only reason I stayed in Colombia so long is, is I, found, I found something that I liked more than I liked staying stuck and staying in fear. And so I made the business work in order to stay. And I had to make the business to work because we we had an unexpected, there's a baby on the way. And then there was no way to stay apart from um, getting a business going. And I guess that the lesson I take out of all this is if you want something enough, you make it happen, right? And and you do the work. And, and that's how I've ended up here in Lakeland, Florida. That's central Florida. It's not one of the trendy places, but I love it. That's cool. So what was the business you had when you were in Colombia? So initially I had a business, well, I I two. <laughs> My first one was an English teaching business and that was okay. And, uh, it, but it was, it was, it, it was kind it failed. I learned a lot from it. So it didn't fail. It taught me a lot, right? The second one was sales training for Colombian companies that were wanting to break into Europe and the U S cross-cultural sales training. Cause my background is B2B sales. That's what I did in my twenties. And that did okay. And, and that had to close, though, because of visa regulations. And then the third one was the one that, that we currently have that's, which, which, as we're recording, it's what, 2023, March-ish. And um, that started 2017. So that's the one that's, that's worked, so to speak. Two fails, one worked. So is that the same business you're running today? Yeah, starting to. It's had various brand names and various incarnations of how we've targeted, how we've positioned, who, what we've done and what we haven't done. Um, but it's, yeah, essentially still the same business, targeting the same market. I would say for three years now, we've run the same funnel. 
to the same market and just made some cosmetic adjustments for the two and a half years before that it was just like flailing around in the dark right trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work and lots of big pivots so yeah so, that's where so we're. mark one of the things i think is yep. interesting you kind of kind of just slide it past there but you know when you talk about your past businesses you're almost yeah almost flipping about the fact like oh that failed oh well, that you know yeah. that, that failed right but you know you continue to to innovate and get up and to your point learn from to move forward yep. You know, one of the things that I always think is interesting about successful people is like, how do they get their mind right? Mm. Because there's so many people that would have gone through some of those challenges you went through and just said, you know what, I'm going to go yeah. back. I'm going to just go back to what's safe and secure. Uh, so how, from a mindset perspective, you know, how do you kind of keep your head right to continue moving forward? So from a mindset perspective, how I keep my head right, and, and I had to train and learn and, and develop this skill. And, and I've had a, a series of great mentors. And one of them, he, 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 it's always, there's always, there's always a message, right? There, there, there's always, you hear the same message multiple times, and maybe you'll have heard this message, but the way he described it really, really got me. And, and that is, you've got a choice when you make any decision that, that you don't know that, that what will happen when you make that decision. You can have faith or you can have doubt. And the decision of whether you have faith or whether you have doubt will impact how intensely you you go into that decision, how intensely you take action, indeed, whether you take action. And bring it back very simply, uh, you know, if you're in a room of people who you want to impress and you're about to sit down on a chair, you sit down on the chair because it belie you believe that chair will take your weight. If you don't believe that chair will take your weight, you won't sit down because you'll be left looking very awkward, embarrassed in front of a group of people you respect. And it's the same to any decision when it comes to any decision in entrepreneurship, it, like classic writing a book, doing a landing page outreach. If you were writing a book and some genie came out of a lamp and said, I'll grant you one wish and they guarantee this will be a New York Times bestseller. You just got to write the book. You probably write the book, right? You, the, 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 the truth is people don't write the book because they don't expect the results. They haven't trained their brain to have faith. So I, going back to Michael Jordan, going back to a, another off of, of, another kind of influence that you'll get these messages. Mike, the Netflix documentary, Michael Jordan in the Netflix documentary, one of it, I don't remember if it was him or one of his teammates said, he always found something to dislike about the opposition. If he couldn't find yes. something, he made it up. So how do you have absolute faith in the ability for you to be successful? You trick your brain, you convince your brain, you lie to your brain until your brain knows that reality. Another influence, Joe Dispenser, meditation. Before I made it into the States, I used to visualize being stood in Disney World with my family every single day for 45 minutes. And nothing happens over a week, nothing happens over a month, but six months in, your brain started to believe that reality. And it's tricked itself into believing that you're in that reality and you start taking the action with faith because the future hasn't happened. So you may as well believe that it's going to happen, right? And, and that's a very long-winded way of saying believe, right? Classic manifestation. Yeah, yeah. That's how it worked for me. I love that. So within what you do, you yep. talked a lot about what didn't work. What is yeah. not working for a lot of the coaches, consultants, and solopreneurs out there today? They need to shift their definition and belief system in the way they perceive what is easy and what is not easy. I think that's what it boils down to. Everybody wants the easy route, whether it's health, losing weight, Whatever, they all want the easy route. That's why they're, they're opting to these funnels. Oh, 10 million leads in two days without turning your computer on. 80 grand a month from LinkedIn in two days, right? I'm not saying these people are lying because that might happen. But they, they automatically default to the easy. And to me, there's a different definition of what's easy. You know, two days to a funnel, to an 80 grand a week business with two in two days. That's the easy they want. What's an easy for lawyers? They have to go and study at college. Then they have to do a certification. Then they have to do a work practice. And they spend half a million over the face of five to six years. So that, and that's easy in order to get the rest of their life, right? For me, six months, seven months, initial clients, three months, four months, and then a steady income stream, that's the definition of easy I want. If someone said to me, that that's what I want, and it's this constant battle with with, with with people who have gone, oh, it didn't work, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, why didn't it work? Oh, I didn't get the results. Well, how quickly did they say they get results? Two weeks. Okay, do you want results in two weeks or are you prepared to do two, two months, six months work? Taking something as simple as podcast guesting, which is a very good way to get clients, 
it takes two weeks to find the, the the shows, to build up your profile, to make yourself look half decent so people will accept you, to get some content on social media. Then you book in the show. Any good show is going to have one one month to two month ramp up to get on the show. Then you get on the show, another month to release. And then before you know it, and after five months, you're in front of a lot of people and you're borrowing their audience, but people won't do it because it's not easy, right? So it's just, for me, it's as simple as redefining the definition of easy. Do you want to be like the, the get rich quick? And by the way, it's fine to get rich quick as long as you're finding it as the right time frames. Or do you want to be the lawyer? I think it, it's somewhere in the middle. People are buying all this trash and then they're blaming the programs when really their expectations are out of line. Does that make sense? It's a very long way of saying it. No, the, you, yeah. you're saying it perfect. I mean, you know, I think so many people, we talk yeah. about a lot with hustle is so many people will do a sprint Right. Yep. They'll, the, anybody can work hard for a day. Anybody can work hard yeah. for maybe a month. Right. But, yep. you know, a, a lot of what, what we've seen is people talk yeah. about the overnight success. And, I, you know, I was overnight success after 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I think uh, the way you phrase it about just what is the definition of easy? I mean, there's there's easy and then predictability. Right. So, yeah. you know, to your point, if uh, you know, I, I've shared the story before where, you know, my son, if you know, he's. He's now 13. If I told him he could be an NBA player, if he just did X guaranteed, yep. still, he may not do it. Right. And, and anyone may not do it, but you're more likely to do it if it's guaranteed. But, but even if it's guaranteed, there's plenty of people that will opt up. So then when you start thinking about and why, because it's not easy, right. That, yep. that level of discipline over that period of time isn't easy, but it's those that can commit to it and, and have kind of that longer term mindset, uh, are really the ones that are breaking through and and never giving up along the way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it is. It's interesting. You, you you guys have been in it a while. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? There really is. Yeah. So when it comes to growing your business, if you're a coach consultant listening to this, mm -hmm. almost what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, 2X might, may not be the benchmark you want. Maybe what you should be striving towards is 3X or 4X. How do you go about getting people to trick their brain to believe that those things are possible? Or maybe rephrasing it is oh, setting is, the is right goal. Is that me? Because I'm still Helping seeing... Them because 10% growth would sound pretty seeing... interesting to me five years ago, but that's not really a good goal. You, you, you cut out then, sorry. So you were saying that... Um... Yeah, so you were saying before that you know maybe 2x growth isn't big enough. Maybe it should be 3X, 4X, or 5X. How do you go about helping your clients identify what is the best goal and then maybe tricking their brain into believing that, yes, this is possible? You know, it. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I give my perspective because I think everyone has... To, I think it's very easy to, to fall in the trap of... Where did I read this from, this book recently? I can't remember the book, but um, I'm going to kindly ask you to reference it. The Psychology of Money, I can't remember the author. But he talks about in the first chapter how he's always going to have more, and I'm paraphrasing, than a lot of people that have made billions because he has something they don't have. What does he have that they don't have? Enough. And so I think it's very easy to fall in the trap of 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x based on the feed, based on what's going on. And, and easily forget, take, take me, like five years ago, I would have I, I, I would have never believed I'd be sat here in the United States doing this with a business and having a team. And, and this was, I'd have given anything to get in this position. Now I'm in this position. Sometimes I get ungrateful and I want more. And sometimes I forget my kids love school. They're in a great school. I'm you're still in love with my wife. We've got two healthy kids. I'm healthy. And I, I got to remember enough is enough sometimes. In terms of the 5X and the 4X, my personal ambition, it's important to find your personal ambition. I don't think I want a, a corporate business. I think I'll be happy with 3 million, 4 million a year, a reasonably sized team, high profitability and and creating time rather than a unicorn startup and being all over the media. And I think the answer is it's different to every, for everyone, right? How do you get there? I don't know. What's your goal? I think you've really got to detach from this, the feeds. And, 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 and I hope this comes across the right way as someone that's moved into the United States. 
the, 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 the materialism is rampant. I spent 10 years in, in Colombia where like, and, and I, I've got to be careful. My wife's Colombian and, and this is no criticism of the country. It's just the way I perceive the reality. It's just my opinion, right? But people buy things and then they buy things so much. They haven't got enough room for the things they buy. So you've got these warehouses where people store them and they go to another warehouse to buy things. And then they haven't got room for the things they bought from this warehouse. So they go in a storage warehouse. It's like, how much stuff do you need? Do you know what I mean? So sure. it's just well, like, for sure. how, how much is enough, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that came across the right way because I don't no. want to upset people. That's just my just my opinion. No, I, I, a good friend of mine has a bunch of storage units and it, it is amazing. Yeah. I mean, uh, pe- there'll be people that'll pack it away and they'll leave it for years to come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But, so uh, one of the things, Mark, you know, for you and, and your focus is really on the B2B yep. side. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, my my day job is running uh, McClone Insurance. So we're a, yep. uh, a, a broker of insurance risk yep. management uh, all over the country. And I, I'm just curious, you know, one of the discussions I've seen a lot of times in kind of the B2B world mm-hmm. is this this inbound versus outbound sales. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, to your point, there's a lot of organizations that um, have been very focused on outbound for many years to come. And then there's some that have, you know, shifted to inbound. And, you know, my perspective has often been there's, it's really a marriage of the two, you know, too many people are kind of black and white on these things. Uh, But just kind of curious on your perspective of kind of inbound versus outbound and and specifically in the B2B space, uh, how those kind of get married. So I agree <laughs> in, in essence with what you say. Well, I do agree with what you say about the mix. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? I heard on the Alex Hormozzi podcast the other day, and, and it's, 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 it's a 17 conversations that changed my life. I've listened to it like five times. There's more value in that than, 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 than a lot of stuff in, in the social media feeds. And he was spoke about how he's been on the side of outbound and outreach and all that. And he would have always been a proponent of that. But now he's been on the other side. He's got a million plus followers on YouTube. He's a proponent of that. And it's very easy to say once you've got there. And I think that 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 in there lies the lesson. You In, in order to get going, there's going to need to be some outbound. There's going to need to be some outreach. There's going to be need to be some hustle. Mm-hmm. Hustle being rightly directed work, not just doing anything. <laughs> but in the process of that, it should not be the expense of building the longer term inbound because I think where, where a lot of people do is they, they just go all in on outbound. And that's not great if you get five years down the road and you've got no following, no audience, no one who follows your work and nobody who's reaching out to you because you're just struck on the proverbial th- treadmill. And that's where I think people, people go wrong. And, and also the offer, you're in insurance, right? So I always talk about Monday morning problems. No one... Well, some people do, but it's one of those offers, right? No one, very few people wake up on a Monday morning and go, I need to buy some insurance. They get a renewal and the renewal happens every couple of years. And when they get the renewal, there's a lot of transaction costs, time, effort, and and so on and so forth to change. In other words, you can't, it's like divorce, re, divorce, relationship coaches for divorce. Not everybody every day is looking for a divorce relationship coach. So therefore, you can only do so much with insurance and, and, and do challenge me if you disagree. You, you've got to rely on hitting the right person at the right time when it comes to outreach. And that's pure hustle. Whereas if you're doing inbound, you can be top of mind when they reach that point to make that investment. So for businesses where there isn't an immediate pressing problem, there's no choice if you want a business. Do you know what I mean? Insurance, you've got to have that. Because otherwise, you're just going to be chasing all, all, all your life. Does that make sense? You've got to do yeah. both. But for me, the, on, the, the, the ultimate goal should be building that inbound. And by the way, that's what we're doing at the moment. We do outreach, but we're also building YouTube and we're building all sorts of other places whilst you whilst outbound to a certain degree funds it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you mentioned before the, you know, the easy, the definition of easy, right? Like yeah. one of the things with outbound is you know, we talk about it all the time with our, with our sales yep. team, you know, outbound is extremely predictable. Yep. Right. Like you can, you can manage the yep. metrics you can. And, yep. and so if you've got nothing else to, if, if your life depended on you growing yep. your business outbound works, you yep. know, but, but to your point, I think your, I think your vision of kind of the marriage of where you are in a business cycle and, you know, what are you yep. building for the long term? I think is right on. Yeah, it, exactly. It's a mix, right? It's a mix. For sure. Mark, while we're talking mm-hmm. about outbound, there's there's a lot of 
cold messaging happening specifically on mm-hmm. platforms like LinkedIn. And I'm sure you're the victim of a lot of that as I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It appears to me that, and I, I did a post about this just because to me, I just shake my head because most of them are really bad. It is yeah. a request to connect with immediately followed up with, hey, can I get a half hour on your calendar to sell you this service? And no warm up, no, hey, how no. are you? What do you do? I put a post out and I said, look, if this is you, you should expect no results. Like, wh- why would anyone connect with you? Why Why would you even bother? Because it's such mm-hmm. a low percentage rate. And someone responded to me, someone that I actually know. He's like, look, Chris, um, I do it. Like, one out of 100 is worth it for me. And I was like, how much time do you have that one out of 100, you'll send that many requests and essentially spam people? That To me, mm-hmm. that's a spam if that's how you approach it. But yet it seems like it's continuing to grow because obviously there, there are a few people responding, but Mm -hmm. what are you coaching your clients as it relates to cold messaging or are you not? You know, we, we do, we do. And, um, going back to what Dustin has said, cold outreach is always going to, 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 to work. But I do, I do believe that the the entry level skill set to get it to work at the bar is rising. Is that fair to say with, with all the AI? I don't know if there's a correlation. We're, we're, we're in like the, the unknown right now. There's so many that you can personalize messages, you can spam people, so many tools. There's so many ways to, to spam people now, right? So the, the, and, and there's so many more filters coming on to deal with that. So the, the bar is rising and, and the bar is increasing. And it, it, it really, there's so many variables to this conversation because it really also depends what you're selling. Is what you're selling transactional? I mean, insurance to a certain degree is more transactional than a divorce coach. Just taking two examples that have already come up in, in the conversation to a certain degree, depending on the type of insurance. So if it's a very transactional offer, it's very, it, yeah, you can play the numbers game. If you're selling enterprise, you've got to hustle, but it's it's harder to get those appointments and it's harder if it's less transactional. So what, what do we do to combat, and, and by the way, the data from Gartner and, and various market research companies says that the role of the sales call is decreasing. Why is the role of the sales call decreasing? The role of the sales call is decreasing because people have less need for a sales call. They can get access to all the information they need without getting a salesperson on a, on a call. So that's another factor. Combine that with all the AI. So how are we combating it? We're just going at a lower level commitment step. Instead of a call, we're just inviting people to events. And when we invite people to events, we collect email, we collect telephone numbers. So we've got a second bite at it too. So we're building an audience, we're building a list, and we're immediately validating whether an offer works, whether they opt in or not, because it's a much lower commitment step to do that. And that's a very simple way to A, know that your offer's resonating, market message fit. Number two, build an audience of people that you can remarket to and follow up with. And number three, avoid the disillusionment of not being able to book calls. That's how we've been doing it. And that's been working really well. We've also added on to that interview funnels. And I say interview funnels, um, just interviewing people in your industry, not the objective of landing as a client. That's terrible. And I've been through those. <laughs> but just to get to know people and build relationships, that's another way that is, that's worked really well. But the number one is just inviting people to events. That's been fantastic. Which goes very closely with your virtual event funnel yeah. that you help yep. your clients with. Yep. Um, I, I would ha- happen to think that a lot of these coaches, consultants, and salespeople yep. are, are, for whatever reason, not interested in doing that. Why, why do you think so many people balk at the idea of hosting an event? It's, well, we, we only sell over events. <laughs> we, 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 do, we do the same thing. And, um, and the reason is, for any sale to take place, ultimately, the prospect has to believe something different to what they believed before they interacted with you. And and a lot and when you're when it comes to educating market, I mean, a lot of the books say it. Break for advertising and it says it, and many books say it in various ways, shape, or form. It's very one of the most expensive things to do is educate take, educate a market and change the belief system. It's much easier to go with the belief system and with the current. And so that's why we do events because I can't, um, because yeah, we have to, we have to leave them to believe that, that, that it's a worthwhile thing to do. We have to unpack the concepts. We have to deal with the objections. 
we have to make a case. And that's why we sell using events. And in fact, that's why it works so well for non-transactional B2B, because non-transactional B2B, there's frameworks, there's intellectual property, there's sometimes multiple decision makers, and, and they have to do that as a matter of course. So to answer, and it's much easier to go, hi, do you want some leads? Hi, do you want some leads? One in 100, right? But uh, th there's pros and cons to each. I've personally always had more success with the latter and doing the events. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. So where, where does one start? If you want to host an event, I mean, obviously you need to have something to yep. talk about, but where, where does a coach consultant go, especially if you say, hey, I don't have a list, I don't have emails? So, so, so the, the first thing they need to do, and this applies more to the coaching niche than the consulting niche, in my personal experience, is they, number one, need to decide if they have a business or they're just messing around pretending they have a business. Because we actually don't, we actually changed our landing page as an experiment, and we were running some ads, and we changed it from B2B consultants, we changed it to B2B consultants and executive coaches. And oh my God, like the, the revenue took a dive. The amount of no-shows on sales calls went up. The amount of, of, of frustrating conversations to find us. We know we can help these people, but they, th th they're in their own way. A lot of them, well, I have a business. Okay, what's your business? Well, I'm deciding between this, this, and this. Oh, I have a business, but I'm starting it next week. So first of all, they need to decide if they're starting a business and not looking for an opportunity because there's a big difference between looking for an opportunity and having a business. Looking for an opportunity means you haven't decided what you're going to do and you're going to land on an opportunity. Having a business means you're 1,000% invested in it, you've taken action, and you're going to do it. That's the most important thing to do. Um, that's what the first thing they need to do. The second thing they need to do is they need to know things worth knowing because the easiest event to do is the Q and a session. What's the Q and a session answer the most 10 common questions your clients ask. If you don't know the 10 most common questions they ask, ask chat GPT, don't hire anyone, ask chat GPT. If you don't know the answer to those questions, you've got no business being in business. You don't know enough, right? There's so many, and you, you've got me on because we like it was so frustrating this tap. We were trying to we tested. It's an example of a test that didn't work. If you don't know enough in your field, go back. Unless you've got a time machine, you're in trouble. In 2017, 2018, you could get away with not knowing anything. Now there's a much higher barrier to entry to get success online. You have to know something worth knowing. You have to have some form of expertise. You have to have some form of deep sector knowledge. You can't have just done a life search certification or um, I'm now an online digital marketing coach because I went with another in the field and they gave me some like cert cert certificate they bought on, they made on some app on, on Canva, right? You have to know what you're talking about. And if you can't answer the 10 most co common questions, don't bother. That, I'm, I'm sorry, that's it. <laughs> like, and then if you do put a landing page in the feed and invite, invite people to it, answer their questions, because if they feel your energy that you want to help, if they feel that, you know what, you know what you're talking about, if they feel you have new ideas, concepts, and they feel most of all, they can trust you with their livelihood, their money and their, and their business and their family, sometimes in those niches, you got no problem. People will soon sniff it out in real time communication. If you know what you're talking about or not, because Nonverbal communication, by the way, is much more powerful than than um, verbal communication. You, you you can say all the right words, but they'll know if you know what you're talking about or not, right? And that's my slightly less palatable version of the reality, right? And sorry, no, <laughs> that's how it is, you know. Well, I think it's interesting, even how that ties into what you were talking about with events, right? Because yeah, you know, what are the difference between you know events versus you know, kind of more of the historical written yeah. blogs and things like that, right? Is an event, you can feel somebody's passion. You can, yeah, you can yeah. feel their energy, right? Versus, you know, it's really hard to feel that in in the written word. And, you know, it's, you, you mentioned the word trust, right? Like if people yeah. start to trust that you have that, they have yeah. that credibility, you have that expertise. And to me, that's what's most interesting about, you know, events is it's a, a way even digitally to kind of get belly to belly with people so that you can have real conversations. Correct. Correct. And yeah, that's why we do events, by the way, because it's what's always worked for us for those exact reasons. Yeah. Mark, Excellent. you create some killer content specifically on LinkedIn that I've seen about yep. using chat GPT for business. Can you talk yep. about some of the ways that you're using it or some of the ways you're coaching your clients to use that? 
So we are toasting them on chat GPT, but the interesting thing is that that my we had 10,000 views on a video the other day. We had 1,000 watch hours on YouTube, mostly from chat GPT. It, and, and this is it. My chat GPT videos are not really about chat GPT. And let me finish. They're just me bouncing off chat GPT yeah. and giving my ideas and thoughts based on the output of chat GPT. That's it. Like... It's like having an interviewer to bounce off, like which I'm sure you do. So I'll the LinkedIn profile one, which was had over ten thousand. I'm like, okay, so here's the fundamental concepts to build a profile on LinkedIn. You need to solve a problem. You need to do this. Let's put that into Chat GPT. I don't like that because I don't like this because. So Chat GPT is just there to bounce off, and that's really what um, the deeper message of AI. It's not there yet to completely build your business, your content and your business plan is there to bounce off and use your knowledge and experience to decide what's good and what's not. And that's worked really, really, really well for the content because it's given a new life to all the content I've been doing for the last five years. <laughs> that's it, really. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and that's that's it. <laughs> it it's it's interesting how... when you... Sorry, go well, for it. Yeah. When, when you've talked about AI, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we've often talked about this, you know, there's there's artificial intelligence and there's actual intelligence <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> it, it's that balance between the two because they got everybody saying that, well, we're going to, we're going to lose our jobs and AI is yeah, going to yeah. take over the world. I'm like in its definition, it's artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Which means it's not actual and don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. There's a lot of uh, shortcuts and value that, that AI yep. can create. I'm not, I'm not downplaying AI, yeah. but it, it, it's the perfect example of saying, you know, okay, would you want Alexa to run your life? <laughs> and absolutely not. Right. Hmm. Uh, but at the same point, you know, how are you leveraging it, frankly, to right. increase your actual intelligence? So it would, is, is that a question of how we're actually using it in our business practical terms? So we have a team. Um, what do we have? Like, four full time and, and, and three contractors at the moment, part time, I guess. Um, and we're using it in very specific places, and that's to repurpose video content into multiple other channels, the written word, and to repurpose video content to other channels. That's where it's been the biggest time saving to us. In the past, if I was to take a podcast, because we have a podcast, and then I was to, to do a podcast summary, I'd have to train someone, they'd have to pull out the best bits, they'd have to write it, I'd have to check it, I'd have to hire them, I'd have to chase them, they'd have bad days, good days. Sometimes we get like, I put it in chat GPT, make this transcript into five bullet points done make it into a youtube headline five options done make it into a blog post of the right syntax with a blog post done make it into whatever right and it's and 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 so for repurposing of content that's where we've really used it we've also used it and i use it today because we build funnels for clients for landing page for clients we were like that uh, they didn't i was asked questions about their niche because there's no substitute for knowledge about a niche and he wasn't quite sure on a point so i was like let's ask chat gpt it gave us everything we needed to take the output and shape it into good copy it didn't give us the copy but it gave us the ideas the problems the symptoms that niche was experiencing and ideas to shape into the copy that we knew would work based on experience doing it so it's no replacement but but it's it's for all those things for, for any sort of copy it's it, if you if you've written a lot of copy it you know, it's great. That's how we're practically using it. It's excellent. So Mark, what, you know, on that kind of guys, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you project in the next three to five years, you know, with, with AI and, uh, you know, tying that to, you know, at the, the higher bar mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, of expertise, you know, what, what do you see in the next three to five years? I think that if, if it's okay to answer that question by saying what I'm personally doing in the business based mm -hmm. on my five-year prediction. And, and first of all, um, is that okay to answer that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and I read this this week. I've been recommended by so many people show your work. Okay. And um, he speaks about in the first chapter, how we're all amateurs. And I feel that we are all amateurs now. No one knows where this is going over five years. So we're all amateurs. And I've got to say this, but I'm, I'm just actioning based on my best interpretation of what's going on. And what I'm doing is I'm focusing on community, building a community. So we, we've launched a show and that show is community. We're interviewing clients and we're sharing and we're just a rising tide lifts all boats, right? Building that community element because AI can't, 
replace community. That's number one objective. These are in no particular order of priority. They just are equal. <clears throat> number two, events. We were already onto that. And by accident, I wish I'd say I predicted it, but by accident, AI can't do real-time live interaction. So we're nicely placed for that. We're doubling down on that. Getting people on, that ties into number one. A show is a form of event. Presentation events, we do those, the Q&As. And um, number three, video content. Um, because, I mean, it will be able to do deep fake and all that, and people are always going to consume trash content, right? But I do believe there's going to be a place, at least for the next five years, for video. So they're the three things we're focusing on. Where will I AI take us? It will probably replace a lot of written work, a lot of customer service work. And I'm going on this based on an interview I saw with Sam Altman on Lex, Lex, Lex Friedman, the the they were talking about this yesterday, and there's, there's a survey floating around giving the, the probability of the jobs going. Programming the, um, will be cheaper, customer service, high graphic design, written word. Yeah, I'm not focusing on those. That's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Excellent. I would love to know, what's your opinion? This is, I'm always so, learning on this. So, I'm, an, I'm an amateur on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you're right on. I mean, when I look where, you know, similar for us and where we're going, I, yeah. mean, I think, you know, there are some very uh, tactical things that will, you know, as been the case in the last 10 years, right? I mean, that'll be more automated that will, um, you know, find more shortcuts and things like that. Yeah. But, um, you know, to me, I still look at, you know, how does, how does business get done? You know, yeah. business yeah. gets done by people talking to people. And yep. that trust transfer. And, uh, I, I think the, I think your element of the bar being higher, I think that's certainly, uh, you know, I agree. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I think it's really just, uh, in a lot of ways, a huge opportunity for the best performers in each industry. So I, yep. you know, to me, you know, those that, uh, you know, frankly are not providing real value in content or, you know, things to create awareness. Well, now those can just be automated with AI, uh, yeah. but, but the real nuggets, the real kind of mind movers of information, you know, AI isn't going to do that. Uh, they're not, they're not going to be able to package that way. Right. You know, AI isn't going to, yeah. you know, like when you're talking about events um, or even video, you know, there's a mm. lot of people talking about, well, AI can do video. Well, yeah, I mean, it can do some, some stock video and some, uh, mm. you know, some fake video. Right. But it, it it's not, I mean, it's not going to be this. Right. And th yeah. Agreed. I, I like the way you, I like trust transfer that encompasses what I said in like five minutes into two seconds. <laughs> Much better answer. <laughs> you should, so you I'm, should just, get into I'm just queuing it from you. I'm just queuing it from you. <laughs> it's so true. What a great way of putting it. Yeah. Oh, your audio has gone, Chris. Or has it just gone for me? I, can't. I think there are a lot of people that still don't know what it is. And yeah. it'll be interesting to me in about two, three years when it becomes more mainstream, because I've talked to people in corporate America, I mean, specifically my wife. She's like, what's that? How does that work? <laughs> How would that benefit me in HR type of thing? And I think it, it can. I think it can be benefit almost anybody in any yep. job, just about. And I think it will become more mainstream. It will be accepted in other industries where maybe it's not so much right now. And I think there'll be more people talking about it because I also feel like there are some people right now who are maybe ashamed or afraid to admit that they're utilizing that for various things and tasks. But I'm excited. Mm. I'm excited to see what it looks like three to five yep. years down the road. I have the premium version and it is Pretty interesting to see how that's developed from mm -hmm. GPT-1 to 2 and, and so on. But as I've started to think about this, I mean, I've been using AI already for a couple of years. There are many tools like Descript. Um, yep, yes, I same. mean, obviously, there's MidJourney. There are hundreds of tools in the market that utilize AI some way, shape, or form that we don't even know. So a lot Calculator. of times... People, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when people say, you know, I'm, I, I don't think that's for me. I'll never use it. Yep. I could list off dozens of tools that they probably already use. So, yeah, who knows? But um, I'm excited for the future of AI. Me too. Me too. Oh, yeah.
Mark, last question from me. Um, yep. You mentioned before LinkedIn um, and specifically LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Are you mm -hmm. leveraging LinkedIn Premium any way, shape, or form? And is that something you feel like your clients should be using? So it's got this, what a great business. They've got the commercial usage gate, haven't they, right? Which means that when you've used a certain amount of time on LinkedIn, you're forced into an upgrade. What a great business model, by the way. So I'm I'm forced <laughs> into it, right? Um, every now and again, I I don't when I can avoid it. It's it's useful. I don't I don't actually love Sales Navigator. My my focus on LinkedIn has been content now for the last uh, don't even know nine months. And that bridge we were talking about earlier, we've done like four years of outbound. I'm like. It's time, right? I, I, I can't do, I can't do that for the rest of my life. So it's not as useful to me as it was, but sometimes it forced me into it. I kind of feel the same way. It's um, what is it, a hundred dollars now? Yeah. Well, by the way, if you cancel it, they'll offer you half price. <laughs> I do that like every, <laughs> every, every, every so often. <laughs> Pro tip. Uh, that's Pro the Mark's Worth promo code right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love it. I love it. Okay. So we, we've had you on the show now for 40 minutes. Yeah. We're really appreciative of your time. For all those coaches and consultants listening, what's the final takeaway that you want to leave with people who are listening, thinking, how in the hell am I going to grow my business? Um, have faith. It goes back to the very beginning of this. Have faith, take action. The majority of people are stuck. Like they want to drive from Florida to San Diego and they're waiting to see the state line for California before they get started. There's no map. It's not there. You just got to get started and have faith. It will be good. That's it. That's it. I love that. I, I believe it. You can, you can write the map as you go. There's no yeah. doubt about that. You've got to get started. Take action. Um, that's the biggest thing I see with a lot of entrepreneurs is they think about it. They want it, but they don't want it enough to take action. Correct. So, yeah, I love that. Mark, thank you so much for your thank time. You. We're very appreciative of your time today being on the show. For all the listeners out there, thank you for your ears. We sincerely appreciate you tuning in for another episode. We'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.